It's always a, a, a special day when we start thinking about and honoring our men and women that have served in our armed forces. And especially this day, when it started on a Memorial Day, when we started decorating the graves of our men that have fallen in combat. Some honoring of somebody that would sacrifice their life and sacrifice everything that they had in order to volunteer or to serve in our armed forces. And when you start thinking about that, you start thinking about the, the sacrifice and the love that they have and the things that they left behind. Whenever you would go to a cemetery, if it's a cemetery that you have a family loved one in, the first thing that you do and you gravitate to that spot where there was a time in your life that you rested somebody that you had a relationship with. And you go back on that Memorial Day weekend or maybe the anniversary of their death, and you go to that spot and you contemplate, and you start thinking about the memory. You start thinking about the, the joys. But it's inevitable that even though you have a lot of joy, you have sadness because of loss. You start thinking about what it could be if we were still together. Or sometimes it's even the regret of not having that relationship that you wanted to have while people were still with you. And any time that you go to a memorial or any time that you go to a grave, any time that you go to a cemetery, there's always that roller coaster ride of emotion, sadness. But there's always that heart and that speaking of, I remember some good things. And as we were thinking about Memorial Day, how can we turn Memorial Day? When we're talking about the loss of our loved ones, the loss of our military, the loss of people that have sacrificed so much, I started thinking about movies. I started thinking about military movies. I started thinking about movies where they were in major combat. And, and uh, one movie that just comes to my mind that probably we've all seen is Saving Private Ryan, right? We've all seen that. And there's about a 20-minute clip in Saving Private Ryan that is uncomprehendable. You guys know what I'm talking about. When they're storming the beach and bullets are flying, people are dying. It's, it's totally uncomprehendable how that could take place. Well, you start seeing these dead bodies and you start seeing everything that has taken place. They continued to rush the hill. They did have victory, but that victory that they had was at great cost. I started thinking about them taking our soldier men and women off of that battlefield and taking them back to their homes and taking them back to their homes and now their parents are having their loved ones in a memorial service. You know, here's where, here's where it gets complicated because they could have laid down every one of their medals and they could have said, you won this medal, this medal, this medal, this medal. You were a country servant and you did all these wonderful things for the country. But you know that pastor has to get up and he has to ask a question. Just because you served in the armed forces and just because you did a wonderful job in serving your country and you had all kinds of medals and honor because of your service to the country, it doesn't change the fact that there's still only one way to get into heaven. So we talk about soldiers and being a good soldier but when it comes down, what do every one of these soldiers have in common? They all died. They all are going to be buried. They still have to take John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, and it says this, if you'd like to watch this on the screen. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, or it should say many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how do we know the way? And then Jesus said this to his disciples said this. He said, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We're thinking about John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, in parallel to Memorial Day. The family members are gathered. There's decisions that have to be made. The pastor has to ask certain questions. The testimony has to be given. And the simple question is asked at every pre-planning memorial service is this, if it's a Christian family. Tell me about his faith. Tell me about a time that he gave his life to Christ. Tell me about a time where he was at a summer camp and he gave his life to Christ and he was baptized. Or tell me a time where he, he did something that was evident that he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And sometimes the family can just give me list after list after list after list of everything that he did. A time that he was saved, a time that he was baptized, a time that he taught a class, a time that he did things for the cause of Christ. And it, a pastor looks at that and says, yeah, I can work with that. I got that. And we can share that during the memorial service. And I can give rest and assurance that this person that gave their life to a country or to a person gave their life to Christ. And now we know that they're in heaven. Because there's one way to heaven. And that's through Jesus Christ. And there's also those times where we have sat with military men. And have given their life. And I ask that same question. And those questions are not answered the same way. They have said, well, they've done a good job. They served well. They were a man or a woman of honor. They have the medals. But I, then I always have to dig a little deeper. And I say, was there ever a time? Was there ever a time that their spiritual life met their real life? And they collided in the spiritual life, their life with Jesus Christ made an impact within their life. And sadly, there's times where they say, no. No, there was no God. There was no Jesus. The church was of no effect into their life. And matter of fact, really there's no relationship with Jesus at all. And at that time, when I have that memorial service, it makes a very def definite fork in the road. Because I want to make sure that the people that we're ministering to understand that heaven was created for everyone, but it's our choice to take that road to heaven. And Jesus did everything within his power. He did everything he could do to die on that cross, to give the church the authority to communicate to a lost and dying world, to rescue anyone from hell to gain access to heaven. So my question is, if we had to have that memorial service for you, if something happened to you and, and your family came into my office and I started asking those questions, could they give me definite answers about your faith in Jesus Christ. Not your deeds. Not that you did great things. Because doing great things do not get you to heaven. It is how, how can the communicator at the funeral that, you, that you're going to share about your salvation experience with Jesus. I wanted to share some things about heaven. And this is, I think, very important for us. And in John chapter 14, verse 2, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Jesus in his Father's house preparing a place for you. Jesus in his Father's house. Jesus is with God preparing a place for you. Now, I like to look at this place as something a little bit different. You know, growing up, we started thinking that the King James uses the word mansions. And that's, that's, a, that's a descriptive word. But I believe in a translation that I like. It says rooms or a place. I believe it's like, it's like when the boys um, have somebody coming over to the house. And they're spending the night. <laughs> we have a trip. And somebody's spending the night at the house. You know, they have a room. They're coming into my house. And they have their room. You know, one thing, 
whenever we build a new house, here's one thing that I'm going to change, okay? I'm not going to have a bedroom with my door right beside the refrigerator. My boys are pigs. They graze all night long. I'm serious. Two o'clock in the morning, the door's open. The, I'm going to bed. Good night, man. Does anybody else have a bedroom right beside the fridge? Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm going to put my bedroom all the way on the other side of the house. Anyway, but when they come over, I believe heaven is God's house. And in his house, he has prepared for you a place, a room. And you have total access to God's house. You have a relationship to him. It's built for you, for your needs. When Jesus went to heaven to prepare a place for you, he was thinking of you. And his communication about you to, to his father is he is going to build a place for you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now we know that the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. Our body is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. It's not even comprehensible on this earth. It is built by God. It's built by the angels of God. It's spoken into existence. Jesus has looked at you, and because you've given him your life, he has given to you an eternal place. Jesus in his Father's house is preparing a place for you. I believe when we look at heaven, we think about what God is doing for us, and he's done so much for us in the past, but what he's doing for us is continual. And then you can be certain about spending eternity in heaven. You can be certain about it. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says that you may, what's that word? Know that you have eternal life. It's not, I hope I have eternal life. It's not, I hope I do good enough to go to heaven. I hope that I have given enough money or I hope I've got, done enough good things. See, in our society today, they think that if I do more good than I do bad, then it's going to equal out and God is going to find me justice because I've done more for him. You know, it has nothing to do with the quality schedule. What it has to do with is a faith. Do you have your faith in Christ? And once I've given my faith to Christ, once I've given him my life, once I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior... I know for sure that I'm going to heaven. In Psalms chapter 23, David writes this psalm, and he says in Psalms chapter 23, verse 6, Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I love this. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness and mercy may follow me, but I know, I know when I close my eyes, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I have to know. So when somebody comes up and talks to us about, about our faith, about our, our living our life for Christ, we live our life because we honor Christ. Our faith is because of what Christ has done for us. Our testimony is, can we share what Jesus Christ has done for me to other people? And I, I hope when I die, I go to heaven. It's, we don't have to hope. Because the word of God is given to us. I have assurance that because I have given my life to Christ, nothing, nothing can pluck the love of Christ out of my hand. He loves me unconditionally. Now, does that mean that I will never sin? No. <laughs> I, you know me very well, and you know that, and I know you, that we sin all the time. But once we have given our life to Christ, we've been adopted into his family. And once we've been adopted into his family, he wraps his arms around us, and he protects us, and he keeps us. Our seal of our salvation is secure. Now, that doesn't mean that we, we don't have desires in our nature that causes us to do stupid things, because we all do. But that doesn't mean because we do stupid things, God says, okay, because you sinned, I'm going to release you from my salvation. No. What happens to a father to a son when something takes place and sin takes place? A father, he wraps his arms tighter around him to protect him. 
So when you are being in discipline from God, and you say, why is God putting me in discipline like this? Let me tell you, because God loves you, and God wants to protect you. He's not going to dictate. He's not going to tell you that you can't sin. You have a free will. You could do what you want. But in that sin that you decide that you're going to be in, that doesn't change the fact that you're saved. What it changes the fact is that you will be disciplined while you're saved. And anybody ever been disciplined while they're saved? Give me an amen. We've all been there. And you say, I don't want that. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. You want to understand that because God loves you, he disciplines you. Because he disciplines, he wants to keep you safe. And he doesn't want to give you over to this world that wants to throw you away. So in your hand, in God's hand, is your life. And there's nothing that can separate you from God's love and God's protection. So we understand that that love of God is going to keep us. And when we understand that, we understand exactly that we have an eternity in heaven because he started that eternity on this earth. And then, I love this third one. There's a book in heaven with names written in it. Anybody know what the name of that book is? It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Many of you know what that book means, but let me tell you what that book is. Whether you're a teenager or Joey Bacon gotten saved when he was eight years old, or maybe you were 18 years old or 50 years old, there's a moment in your life where God looks deep into your soul and he knows your heart. He hears your mouth and he even sees your life. But God looks into your soul. And there's a moment that when you gave your life to Jesus and you said, Father, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to walk after you. The Bible says angels in heaven rejoice at one sinner coming to repentance. Why, Why are they rejoicing? Because something has taken place. A transfer from Satan's family into God's family just took place. And in that transfer, the angel takes the Lamb's book of life and he writes down your name in that Lamb's book of life. And that name that is written in that Lamb's book of life can never be erased. It is always in the book. Now, how do we know that? Let's look at a couple verses, and these verses are very important. So let's first look at Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the Spirit are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your name is written in heaven. Rejoice about that. Rejoice that you are written in the Lamb's book of life. It is something that when you gave your life to Christ, the angels of heaven have rejoiced. We should rejoice knowing for sure that we have a place in heaven when we die. In Revelation 21, 7, 21, 27, it says, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what was shameful or re- deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So that's kind of an oxymoron a little bit. Nothing impure will ever enter, nor will anyone who does is shameful or deceitful, but only those names who are written in the Lamb's book of life. What does all that mean? Bruce, I've done deceitful things. I've done shameful things. Does that mean my name can't be written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Let me ask you this question if you're honest with me. Have you ever done something deceitful or shameful? Raise your hand. Okay. If the story stopped there, none of us will have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But let me tell you how I know my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Just like Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. When you accepted your forgiveness, when you said, I was a stupid, rotten sinner, I did things that was not right, I hurt other people, I was a sinner. And you fell on your face before God, and God said, you're forgiven. What took place on a cross 3,000 years ago when Jesus was stretched between heaven and hell and he shed his blood for you and for me. They call that the cleansing blood of Jesus. 
And because you gave your life to Christ, God took the blood of Jesus and he clean, cleaned your life. You are clean. You are righteous. You have no sin from God's perspective to your perspective. There is no deceit. There is no shame entering heaven because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and Jesus took all of your sin upon his back and he bore your sin. He became sin so you would not have sin. And because we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and we have sin, Jesus took our sin so our names could be written in the Lamb's book of life. There will not be deceit in heaven or shame in heaven because Jesus took our sin for us. Now, when you think about that context, how can you not love God? How can we use the name of Jesus in a flippant way when we know what he has done for us? Man, if you could just write down I don't have big enough pads to write down all of our sins, but just write down our sin. I mean, we could go pad after pad after pad of stuff that we have done that any one of those things would keep us from heaven, but each one of those things Jesus died for. And because Jesus died for them, all of the things that we've ever done is wiped clean because of him. It's something that we should say, thank you, Lord. Verses 20 uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. And anyone not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Wow. The contrast. Here's what you gain. You give your life to Christ. You accept him as your Lord and Savior. Your sins are forgiven. The Spirit of God is indwelt within you, and you have the power to live your life and to deal with the things of this world. You know that your sins are forgiven. You know you're going to heaven. You absolutely know because of God that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you can stand in front of that preacher and say, there was a day that I gave my life to Christ, and I know it for sure. My sins have been forgiven. I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Or you stand in front of that preacher on that funeral memorial day, and you say, you know, there's not really much spirituality to his life. Wow. What does the preacher do? The preacher has to communicate the love and the forgiveness and tell you absolutely the same thing that I'm telling you. It is only the way, the truth, and the life. When, um, when I stood before my brother's funeral, he was, he, he was in Wamego. And uh, at that time, you, yeah, I know you've heard the story, but at that time, uh, my family wasn't believers. And uh, I had a compelling desire within my life to, uh, to be the white sheep of the family, I guess, but to, to, share, to share the story. And my family were not believers, and I, I shared the story about my brother. About how he did not have a relationship with Christ. And uh, it was hard. It had been easy for me to say, you know what, I truly wish that uh, uh, there was some evidence of salvation. But I went through what Jesus Christ has done for me and how I love him but how I wanted my family to hear about the forgiveness and the love of Christ. But standing at a memorial service with your brother that did not have a relationship with Jesus, and you know that you'll never see him again, and you know the outcome if you know the word of God, it was a motivator within my life to say this, I don't want to do this again. I want my family to see Christ. I want to do everything within my power to let them see Jesus in me so my family can see Christ. So the next funeral service I do for my family, I can stand up and say, I know without a doubt 
that my brother or my sister or my father is alive in heaven because of their testimony in Christ. And because we did that with my brother, it started a domino effect with my family. My mom and my dad got saved and some of my other brothers and sisters got saved and it wasn't much longer than that than my dad did pass away. And I had the privilege of standing in front of my dad's funeral and got to tell the story of my dad giving his life to Christ. What a contrast. What a contrast for me. The proclaimer of the funeral, having a brother that was the best man in my wedding with no hope. To the father that gave me life to say there is hope and this is the reason why. He gave his life to Christ. He bowed his knee and accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What a testimony. And the last one is your confirmation number in heaven. You know what your confirmation number is? JN316. It is JN316. If you take the gospel and you write down JN316, that gains access to heaven. What does that mean? For God so loved the world that Bruce Thomas, that he gave his only son, so whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So let's forward your life. Let's forward my life. Let's look at every one of our military soldiers that died in combat. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So instantaneously when we pass from this earth, we stand before God. What is it if you had this ability not to stand before St. Peter? You're standing before God. You're standing before God face to face. What would be if he would ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? Because I did good things, because I went to church, because my daddy was a deacon, or because we tied to the church, or because I never missed. I went to vacation Bible school, or I went to Easter every, every year. Uh, why, why? And you know what? The only answer that you can say is, for God so loved me that he gave me Jesus, and he sent him on this earth, and he died on the cross for my sins. I accepted him. I don't deserve heaven. But Jesus, he gave me the key. And he said, I want you to come to my house when you die. And if you accept that, you gain access to heaven. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect because you're not. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have issues within your life because you are. But you have access to a power greater than yourself, and that is God to go through your problems and understand that there's an end to your problem. And that end is heaven. So on this Memorial Day, my challenge is very simple. Are you, have you made your reservation in heaven? I can't tell you that. You are the only one that could know. But I do know what a reservation will do for you. We were coming back from a conference and we were stuck in Denver, Colorado. Three of my buddies were stuck in Denver, Colorado. And we thought somebody else made the reservation. Now the National Republican primary or convention was in Denver that day. And we went to every hotel in town. We could not find a hotel. The confirmation number that we thought we had it wasn't valid. There was no empty hotel rooms in Denver for that night, and our flight didn't leave until 2 o'clock that next afternoon. We were stuck. And with three stinky guys, we slept in a car. Because we tried to get in any hotel room that we could, and we couldn't find one. You know, the simple thing is a confirmation number. You walk up to a hotel, and you have that confirmation number that they gave to you, it's JN316. 
say, here's my confirmation number. They're going to pull it up on the computer. Now, they may have overbooked, but they're going to make it right. But if you do not have your confirmation number, all they're going to say is, sorry, sir, we are full. In heaven, the Bible says, if you have your Bible, let's turn to, uh, Neil, can you put up John 3.36? John 3.36 up on the screen. If you have your Bibles, turn to John 3.36. I don't have it written in my notes, but I wanted to see if he could pull it up. You want me to stall for a couple seconds? Okay. If I stall for a couple seconds, um, John 3.36 is a, is, a, is a verse that tells us in the Bible good and bad. If you have Christ, it's very good. If you do not have Christ, it is very bad. So when you're looking at our faith, talking about heaven or talking about hell, talking about this Memorial Day, John chapter 3, verse 36 is, is a verse that takes John 3, 16 at a whole different level. Got it? And it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's all in that text. If you believe in God, you're going to have eternal life with God. If you do not believe in God, the wrath of God is going to be upon you. So the challenge is make your reservation. Have faith in Christ. Look at your family and say, what can I do to make sure that I bring my family with me to heaven? And make it a, a job. Make it something that empowers you. Make it something that's important to you because the wrath of God is going to be upon those that do not give their life to Christ. The wrath of God. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. It's going to be for you if you do not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Oh, that's what salvation is all about. That's why it's important for the church for you, for me, to look at people with compassion. Not judgment, but compassion. How can I take people with me? How can I take my family with me? Do I have a motivator within my soul that I don't want anyone that I love to fail to see Jesus because of me? And if you've never accepted Jesus, I promise you, it is the greatest decision that you will ever make for your inner soul and satisfaction and for your eternal destiny. It is the greatest decision ever. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. and Lord, on this Memorial Day, when we think of those that have lost their lives before us, and we go to these graves... And we put flowers and we cry and we laugh. But in any one of those graves, we as Christians will look at that. And we will look back at their life and we'll wonder, did they have a relationship with you? And some of them would have not. And some of them would have. I pray that that will be a motivator within our soul, within our life to make sure that we have that relationship. And if we do not, I pray that we would accept you as our Lord and Savior today. Be with us. Convict us where we need to be convicted. Forgive us where we have failed you. Give us a burning desire to have faith and fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we do. Amen. You know, I'm going to, you know, there's times, you know, there's, there's different types of churches. You know, there's some types of churches that will have an invitation every Sunday. And have everybody stand up and you'll come to the altar and you'll pray for different things. And there's sometimes that I preach a sermon that I want it to be an intellectual sermon and I want you to think about it. I want it to transfer your life and your heart when you get home and you can think about things. But I do believe there are times where if something needs to be prayed about, I believe that the body of Christ, the church, should wholeheartedly take an advantage of having the power of God upon their life. 
what I would like to do, we finished the sermon early. It's only 11.30 because I want to take five minutes to do something. I want to ask Greg to come up to the platform. And I would like for you, this is not about the church service. This is about your life. I would like for you to make sure, number one, that you are reserved in heaven. That's the most important thing. And the other thing, if you're, if you're already saved, you're already going to heaven. I know, like me, you have family and friends that are not. You have people that work with you that are not saved. And they even may ridicule you or laugh at you or mock you. That's okay. God's greater than that. The only way that we're going to transfer what God has given to us to another person is if we ask God's power to give to us the words to communicate the truth of Jesus to them. So my invitation today is, I want you. I want you to make sure that you're part of God's family. And then if you are part of God's family, I want you to reach, reach your arms out. I want you to start thinking of people that are around you. Maybe it's your family members. Maybe it's your own kids. Or maybe it's your parents or coworkers that you think, well, you know, I really don't know if they're children of God or not. I want you to just ask God by name to protect them and to give you an opportunity to communicate to them about the love and the forgiveness of Jesus so they can join your family. That is what an invitation is all about. Getting our knees and our hearts in tune with God. So would you please stand to your feet?